Hello and welcome to my talk about uh, the injustice of non-free software and muted. online disservices. I'm going to start by talking about the free software issue, which I have some slides for, and then I'm going to go on to the servers issue. And uh, that's something I have much less practice in speaking about. So here are the slides about free software. And when I say free software, that refers to freedom, not price. So in French, I'd say logiciel libre. I would not say logiciel gratuit because it's not a question of price at all. That's a side, a minor side issue. There's nothing immoral about buying and selling things, not as such. In some cases, there may be something wrong with it, but in general, it's okay. And I don't object to selling a copy of a program for some money. And I also don't object to giving away a copy of a program. Uh, I used to sell copies of GNU Emacs, but it was free software. It was covered by a license permitting copying, modification, redistribution, publishing modified versions. So it respected users' freedom. It was Libra, but it, those copies were not gratis. Other copies were gratis, but that's a minor side issue anyway. And it shouldn't distract you. The issue of price shouldn't distract you from the issue that affects the right and wrong of the area of the question. So why won't this move? So what is a computer? Well, it's something that grabs instructions from a program and executes them. And depending on what program you put in the computer, it can make the computer do this or that or whatever. Um, so really, the crucial thing is that program that you happen to be running and who gives those instructions to your computer. Now, you, because with the right program, the computer could do anything except the things that are impossible like this. There's no instruction to make flowers grow out of the screen or even holograms of flowers. That's impossible. There are other things that a computer fundamentally can't do. But within the range of what's possible, the right program will do what, whatever it might be. So who gives those instructions to your computer? You might think it's you when really it's somebody else who does not have your best interest at heart. You might think that your computer is obeying you when really it's obeying someone else if you're using an iMonster, then it's obeying Apple all the time. And it will offer you some things you can do, but only the things that Apple will tolerate. So with any program, why won't this work? Why won't these? What the hell is going on? It's supposed to be the case that I can push these keys and it will go to the next slide. Instead, I have to click this small button here. Uh, so with any program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the programs control the users. There's no other way it can be. So it's always one or the other. Well, when the users control the program, that's free software. Because that, uh, what does it mean? What is freedom? Freedom is having control of your own life, control of the activities you do in your life. Well, when you do the activity using a program, to have control of your activity means having control of that program. So, <clears throat> uh, that's what enables a program to respect users' freedom, letting the users have control of that program. Uh, but if the users don't control the program, 
then it means the program controls the users, and that's non-free software. So in order for the users to have control of the program fully, they need the four essential freedoms. Uh, so these are the practical criterion for a pre-program. If the program gives its users these four essential freedoms, then the users have control over the program, and they have control over the things they do with the program. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program any way you wish. So that means you can directly control what running the program does. But that's not enough. That's only the freedom to do whatever the program is already written to do. If you don't like that, how you're going to control your activity when the program insists you have to do it this way and only this way, or maybe you have to do one of these hundred things, and if none of them is right for you, you're stuck. Well, freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program operates the way you wish. Now, this requires having the source code. Uh, your, I gather, programmers, you know what source code is. Uh, if you see the source code, you can understand it if you know the programming language, and then you can, you can understand the program, and you can change the program and do something different. But often, non-free programs are distributed only as executables, which are a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, and if it gets big, it's basically not possible to understand what those ones and zeros do. A real program can have 100 million ones and zeros. It's just too hard to be feasible to make the changes you want in that form. So one of the prerequisites for Freedom 1 is you get the source code. Well, Freedom 0 and 1 enable individual users to change the program and make it do what they wish. It gives the users individual control of the program. And this slide shows that. There are four users here using the same program, and one is exercising freedom one to change it, and the other three are using it the way they got it. Well, if you, if you would rather not make the effort of changing it, that's fine. You don't have to. So individual control is good, but it's not enough. Because a lot of users are not programmers. They don't know how to understand source code or change it. But they do deserve the right to have control of the software they're using. But how can non-programmers participate in that? Since they don't know how to change the code themselves, they need collective control which is the freedom for groups of users to join together to change the program and make it do what they wish. So here we see a group. I don't know if you, can you see my pointer at all when I move the mouse over it? I you guess you probably. Unmuted. Oh, so it does show up. So at the top, you'll see a group of three users unmuted. who are working together to change the program. Now, two of them appear to be programmers because they're touching the code. The third one is not a programmer, but does participate in the decisions about what changes to make. This is how non-programmers can participate and control the program by working with others. Of course, they don't, all the users don't have to work together. It's and totally voluntary to participate in a group like this. Here are two more users who are using the same program. They're using the original version. They're not participating in this group. Of course, maybe they're welcome to participate in the group. They could certainly ask. They could start another group. They could join some other group. It's entirely up to the people concerned. So to have this collective control requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and distribute them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions and distribute those to others when you wish. And distribute includes both giving away and selling. You could do either one. It's up to you. So these two freedoms enable a group 
of cooperating users to maintain their versions of a program. Uh, here's how it works. One user makes a modified version and under Freedom 3 can distribute copies of that to some other users and each of them has Freedom 2, which means the freedom to make exact copies of that and distribute them to more users. So between Freedom 2 and Freedom 3, any group of users can cooperate. And the group doesn't have to have a membership list. It's simply whichever users choose to cooperate at any given time. Which means that when you're redistributing copies, you can offer those copies to the general public. You're not limited in any way as to who you distribute copies to. So if the program carries these four essential freedoms, <clears throat> then it's free software. Because of these four essential freedoms, the users fully have control over the program. So it will generally do what they want to make it do. That is the ethical way for software to be distributed. But if any one of these freedoms is missing or incomplete, then the users do not control the program. Instead, the program controls the users and the program's developer controls the program. So what we have here is a system of unjust power, power for the developer or owner of the program over the users of the program. This program, because it is not free software, is an instrument of unjust power. These programs are nowadays distributed, sorry, developed specifically so that some entity can get power over people. They are not merely uh, inferior morally, they are injustices. Each one individually is an injustice. And this is why I am so strongly concerned not to be using any of them. They're uh, morally objectionable, and all I want to do with them is escape from them and then help everyone else escape from them. And ideally, they would cease to be developed because they wouldn't impose power over anybody anymore. So nowadays, non-free programs mistreat users not only by denying them control over their computing, but they're designed with malicious functionalities to mistreat users. So it's not just, and these are not bugs, these are no accident. They were developed specifically because somebody said, hey, we've got power over a lot of users. Let's take advantage of that power. Let's mistreat them to our own gain. So uh, the Amazon swindle is full of malicious functionalities. It used to be my universal example, but now there, I do know of some kinds of malicious functionalities it may not have. There's no easy way to be sure it doesn't have any particular malicious functionality, but we know of some it does have. For instance, snooping. Uh, the swindle not only tells Amazon what books, what book the user is reading, but what page as well. So it's uh, intense spying. There are lots of other non-free programs that spy. Uh, in general, if it'll ever have the chance to communicate with some online disservice, it'll probably, if it's ever connected to the net, it will send to the disservice it's associated with data about the user. You've got to expect that from a non-free program. And then there are even uh, appliances, products that you buy that requ require communication with a particular disservice. The Fitbit was the first one I found out about. It would send data on the user's uh, running or walking to the service, and then the service would offer to sell the user that same data about per which is uh, which takes some gall, I'd say. 
but there are a lot of them. You know, there are light bulbs that uh, can be switched on or off by control, and uh, but they tell some disservice when they turn on and when they turn off. And there are home controllers that do this, that report every operation they do. Uh, there are cooking devices that the owner, supposed owner, can't actually control except by way of some online disservice, which will keep track of everything. There are even sex toys, which are meant to be controlled through the internet. And the service, the server that mediates between the user and the uh, device uh, keeps track of the commands and some responses as well. The device has a thermometer so that the server can tell whether it's in contact with a human body. And I suspect it can also tell how it's in contact with a human body. And if the owner configures it to accept remote commands from somebody else, well, I expect that server knows who the somebody else is, as well as who the owner is. They could generally put together all these data for the better to profile you with, my dear. So uh, I wouldn't accept, I wouldn't tolerate the presence in my home of a device like that. It's a form of design that I say should be illegal. But wait, there's more. Uh, aside from spying and tethering to servers, there's also DRM. Well, I mentioned a little about DRM, but generally what digital restrictions management means is the malicious functionality of stopping users from doing the things they most want to do. This got started in the 80s, but became widespread in the 90s. And nowadays, you can expect digital products and software in certain areas to be designed to restrict their users. They're no longer designed to serve their users anymore. They're they're, they're not your servants, they're your prison guards. Well, this illustrates the infamous Blu-ray disc and the Blu-ray with which it attacks the user who tries to share. Well, I find this so outrageous that I absolutely refuse to use a Blu-ray disc. I'd rather do without seeing that movie than see it in this way. I'd feel ashamed of myself if I if I gave in. But you know, if you've given in in the past, it's not too late to stop. You can say to hell with this. I'll get a copy somehow that won't stop me from sharing it, that will not force me to be a jerk. And of course, there's DRM and lots of things, including the Amazon swindle. Moving on, there are also back doors. Programs can have back doors, which means basically the program waits to receive a command from somebody else telling it to do something, usually something that you won't like. Because if it were something you would like, there'd be no need for the back door. You would just have a command in the menu, and when you wanted to do it, you'd do it. But the point of the back door is somebody else wants to do something to you that you wouldn't like and wants to force it on you and give you no way to stop it. And one of those is remote erasure of books in the Amazon swindle. And we found out about this one day when Amazon decided to delete thousands of copies of the book 1984 by George Orwell. I'm not making this up. It sounds like something someone would write in a satire, but no, it's the truth. I don't know whether they also tried to delete Animal Farm at the same time. Uh, there was another book that they tried to delete at the same time that did delete, I suppose. 
so there was a big uh, out wave of outrage. So people, Amazon said it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. Think about that in 1984. Well, I don't want to read my books through any device like this, through any device that might connect to the internet and have non-free software in it because you can't trust a non-free program. Now, why do I say that and can connect to the internet? Well, I have a microwave oven and I don't know whether it has a computer and software. It might have a special purpose chip, but since it doesn't connect to the internet, I can't change that software and nobody else can change that software. So if it, whether it's software or a chip doesn't matter to anybody and I can treat it as if it were a chip but once it can communicate with some kind of network with other people then it does matter whether others can change that software and I have to assume that they can so in terms of uh, back doors we know of quite a few not as common as snooping, of course. Almost anything you've heard of will snoop. Now, a back door in a driverless taxi could be really dangerous. Suppose somebody tells the taxi to take you to secret police headquarters, uh, and it, it would just do so, and it could be told to keep the windows shut, ignoring your controls, keep the doors locked, and you'd be trapped in it. How could you ever trust such a device? Well, if it's your car and it's run by free software, then you've got a basis to trust it. If it's a taxi though, well, it's hard for you to ever trust it, unless it doesn't know who you are. Then there is censorship. Well, Apple's uh, eye monsters practice censorship of applications, which is why we call them jails. And uh, because the feeding the censorship so you could install forbidden programs is known as jailbreaking. And uh, then there are even universal backdoors. A universal backdoor is able to in install changes in software on remote command. So we know that Windows, uh, for several versions now, has had a universal backdoor. Microsoft can forcibly in install any change remotely. So, uh, this is how bad it can get. By the way, the Amazon Swindle also has a universal backdoor. And uh, Android and iOS have something that comes pretty close, although not exactly. Uh, they have the ability to forcibly erase any app at any time on remote command. And in Android, it can forcibly install any app at any time. Uh, I don't know if there are nasty things that they couldn't possibly do that way. An Android expert might know. There, and so you put these things together and it becomes pretty bad. So Netflix does three nasty things. It spies on the users. It makes a dossier of everything any given user watches. And users have to identify themselves in order to pay at least. And it puts DRM chains on the users. And then there's another nasty thing which is not in the code of the program itself. But they insist that users make a corrupting antisocial commitment namely the commitment to refuse to share copies with anyone else basically saying i promise to be a jerk i promise to act badly to other people now this is one of the one of the issues that most strongly motivates me to reject it 
because I'd feel really ashamed if I agreed to that. I check agreements I'm asked to sign to make sure they don't include any, you won't share this with people, except perhaps if it's about non-free software that I'm never going to download anyway, so I'll never have a copy. But I think about that question. Can I make sure I'll never have a copy? Because I don't want to ever have a copy. You see, it's non-free software. It's, it would be mistreating me as well as making me mistreat others. So three bad things about Netflix, any one of which is enough reason to refuse to deal with it. Now, I give you a few examples. Of course, there are a lot more. In gnu.org slash malware, you can see lists of hundreds of different examples of malicious functionality. Sometimes it's swindling users. Uh, it's all sorts of horrible things, a variety of them. So take a look there. And here's a nasty thing that doesn't involve a malicious functionality in the code itself. But I've read, you can find the uh, reference there, that uh, when Microsoft finds out about a bug in Windows, before an exploit specifically, before fixing it, it tells the NSA about the exploit. So that Microsoft is helping the NSA attack Microsoft's own users, Microsoft's own customers. Uh, and it can do that because this is all non-free. These things are all secret. How would you know? Of course, other companies might be doing the same thing. We have no way of telling. It's just that in the case of Microsoft, we have a, an article to point to which published this. So basically, most people are users of proprietary malware. Most people who use non-free software, almost everyone that uses non-free software is using non-free malware because the main operating systems are all malware. I've already described them. So uh, they all spy, and most of them do worse. And uh, why do they design it this way? Because it's profitable and they have no moral scruples that would stop them. Now I should point out that any program can be released as free software by whatever company holds the copyright or whatever person holds the copyright. That person can release the code as free software. Uh, person or company. I'm not, I'm not going to treat corporations as persons. Uh, and that same owner can also release the same code as non-free software. And that same owner can do both at once in parallel. It is perfectly possible to release the code as free software in that way and as non-free software in this other way. And there's no conflict legally or practically. <clears throat> now, whether a program is free or non-free and whether it is malware or honest are in principle independent questions. All four combinations are possible and also varying degrees of maliciousness are possible for both free and non-free software. But in practice, we find that free software is almost entirely honest and non-free software is generally more or less malicious. And there's a systematic reason for that. Basically, uh, it has to do with the, uh, the interests and the power that the developer has. You see, with non-free software, when you run non-free software, you are placing your faith in a company that has total power over you and can only be restrained in use of it by a powerful reaction from users, which only rarely happens. So you're basically 
since you can't check what it's doing, it's blind faith or nothing. And if you feel like having faith in those companies, if you feel that they're worthy of your faith, well, I guess uh, go and do that. Uh, but with free software, rational trust is possible because there's a basis for it. And the basis is that the users get the source code and groups of users are looking over that source code because they want to make changes or debug bugs. But in the process, they're also checking for anything that seems to be a mistake. And they can fix it too. They can report what they've seen. This gives the users some amount of ability to check on things and fix them. This is what it means for the users to have control of the software. And the more users want to do this, the more they can do it. It's just a matter of uh, how much you want to do it. So the result is non-free software you can't rationally trust. It gives power to somebody who is very likely to want to cheat you, mistreat you, and wipe the floor with you. Uh, whereas with free software, you can trust it. And this is, of course, why non-free software tends to have so many malicious functionalities, because the developers know that you're stuck with having faith in them, but they can get away with almost anything, and you usually can't tell. And if you do find out, what choice do you got? Maybe there's a competitor who is just as bad. Uh, so in the absence of strong moral principles, they will, uh, they will mistreat you, especially since they're all competing to see who can mistreat you more. So if you're wise, you will reject that software and come to the free world we have built with the GNU operating system and the kernel Linux, we've made the GNU plus Linux operating system, which enables you to run a computer in freedom. Now, I started developing the GNU operating system in the beginning of 1984. And in 1991, it was complete aside from a kernel. It didn't have that. Now, some of the components we had written in the GNU project and some components we found lying around developed by other groups for whatever purpose. But it hadn't been so they could have a free operating system. That was our goal. And in 1991, Torvalds released a kernel called Linux, which filled the last gap. And together they made a free operating system which we call GNU slash Linux, because it's basically GNU, but the kernel it has is Linux. So to give us credit, please call the thing GNU slash Linux. Please don't call the combination Linux, because that gives the main developers of the system none of the credit. Please be considerate. Recognize our work. Now, there are thousands of different variant versions of the GNU plus Linux system. They're called distributions, and each one has a group that maintains it and decides which programs to include. And most of those groups include some non-free programs, which means if you install that distro, you'll get non-free code. Perhaps it will offer you the non-free programs and maybe it'll tell you which ones are non-free, or maybe it'll just install them automatically because it assumes you need them or you want them. You can't really tell. But there are a few distros that are 100% free because they're developed by people that have a commitment to freedom and they reject non-free programs on principle. If you want to make sure you're not running non-free software, install a free distro. And here is the directory that gives all the information <clears throat> about this issue. Uh, which distros are free, which distros that you've probably heard of are not free and in a very general way why, <clears throat> and what our precise criteria are.
Now, the developers of non-free distros, of course, they don't admit that that's a flaw. They don't present it as a flaw. They 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 choose some other quality. They treat it as more important than respecting freedom. And so they want what a good job they've done in some other area, like uh, Ubuntu. The developers of Ubuntu, they include non-free software, even some rather nasty ones. Uh, and instead of saying, well, gee, uh, we decided not to offer you freedom, they say, look at how great our user experience is. So it's a matter of what your priorities are. And for them, it's a matter of what priorities they advocate, what priorities they encourage you to adopt. You'll find that outside of the free software movement, most people when dealing with software prioritize convenience, efficiency, low price, reliability, practical benefits. And they say nothing about the benefit which is the most important of all, namely having freedom. Because they don't believe freedom is important, at least not in using a computer. So uh, it's, it's very easy to just go along with their ideas and not even think about it much. So uh, pay attention to the question. Notice what they're not saying as well as what they are. <clears throat> Now, these are about choosing a license for your, for your programs. There are differences between different free licenses, but I'll skip that. Look at <clears throat> gnu.org slash licenses slash license recommendations.html for how we recommend you choose a license for your work, something you've written that you're going to distribute, and uh, that means you can choose whether to make it free, and you can choose how to make it free, which, which license you'll publish it under. It makes an important difference. <clears throat> now, you should be aware that nowadays many web pages have software in them, and the web server sends this software to your browser, which receives it silently and runs it silently, and you don't even know that it's happening. And sometimes that's, often that software is non-free, and sometimes it's malicious, but your browser won't tell you anything about that. Unless you've installed the LibreJS add-on, that checks, it, it tells you that there's JavaScript code in the page, it checks whether it carries a license, it checks whether it's trivial, and trivial programs it will ignore, figuring that what it does is harmless <clears throat> and not complicated enough to be really nasty. So in those cases, or if the code is free, it'll run that code. And there are ways, although not as convenient as one would like, for users to maintain sets of patches to that code so they can modify uh, these free programs. But it's a bit cumbersome. Really, that's not the way it should be done. The website should publish an API, and it should commit to keeping that API stable, and then people should release free programs to talk to those APIs. That way, the users will be in a position to fully exercise control over the software they're going to run on their own machines. Now, watch out for those that offer for a particular kind of disservice where the service is, it'll run a program for you. A program that, in principle, if, you, if they gave you a copy, you could run on your own computer. And then if it's free, as it morally ought to be, you'd have control, and the other users with you would have control over what's going to be done for you and them by that program. But if the program's running in somebody else's server, automatically the users have no control over it. 
even if it's a free program that's running in that server, the users don't control that copy. You know, suppose there were a server that offered the service of running GCC for you. Well, GCC is a free program that I wrote, initially wrote. Uh, and if you download a copy, well, that's a copy that you have control over. You get the source code. You can change it. Groups of users can make a project to change it. But if somebody sets up a machine to run GCC for you, well, you can't change the GCC running on somebody else's server. And indeed, it would be absurd to insist that you be allowed to do so. What if there are a thousand users of that server? Could we say that each one has the right to change that same copy of GCC? What if they disagree with each other about what changes they want? Well, the only way you can control the software is if you run it on, if you run your copy. You know, if a server will let you install your own software, suppose it's running, renting you a virtual machine in which you install whatever software you wish, well, then those are your copies and you have control over them, just as if it were a physical machine in, in your living room, you'd have control over it. So the point is, whose copy is it that's running? If it's not your copy, if it's the service of running that program for you, but you don't get to decide which program, we call that service as a software substitute. It's actually not a program that you're getting. It's a service instead of a program. It's lack of control where you should be getting control. So that's one kind of disservice, but there are many other kinds. Uh, I'm going to skip this. So we want freedom, but how can we get it? Well, what, you know, what are the obstacles we have to cross? Well, one of them is that the idea of free software and its moral values is being basically drowned out by an amoral alternate philosophy which uses the name open source. You will have noticed that I haven't used that term at all. I generally don't use that term except to criticize it and the reason is it stands for different values that are not mine that I don't wish to promote. <clears throat> the values of the free software movement are what i've told you freedom for the users freedom and cooperation being free to be a good member of, of your community and cooperate with others share with them because you're not being divided and conquered by anybody the open source values are purely convenience the practical values uh, no surprise, Ubuntu uh, uses the banner of open source and promotes the values of open source. So you shouldn't be surprised that malicious functionalities have been inserted directly into it by the developers of Ubuntu. But they're not against that, right? Why wouldn't they? So... <clears throat> you get to choose which values you're going to promote. You can say free software, Libre. Uh, you can say Libre even when you're speaking English and make it clear that you stand for freedom. And you can add to that by criticizing some programs because they're not free. And you could say you wish you weren't using those non-free programs because it sort of rankles every time you do. And if you have a class where they tell you to use Zoom or some other non-free program to communicate, every meeting at the beginning of the, of the class, you can say, you know, I really resent that you're making me run this non-free program, Zoom, or whichever. It takes a few seconds, and it shows that you haven't forgotten about the affront to your freedom merely because it's been going on for months. Well, you probably noticed that most 
uh, discussion, most media attention, talks about open source and never talks about free software or libre or freedom. It's a little better in French. Uh, but the point is, that means that our values are being buried. We have to pay attention to making people aware of them. And you can help in a fundamental way just by doing that. Now, another obstacle is when they won't tell you how your computer is controlled, what its commands are. Computer or some product with a computer in it. Often the actual commands are secret. And the only way you can run it is to install a non-free program they wrote and hope and pray that it isn't designed to mistreat you in some way that's not mistreating you right this minute. Well, that's a bad practice, releasing devices, and this includes peripherals often, without telling the users how to operate them. Instead, they offer you a non-free program and say, run it and shut up. Of course, we don't shut up. We look for a reverse engineer to study the product, write down how you control it, what the commands are to that peripheral or whatever, and then handing that to a programmer. The programmer can then write the free replacement, and that's how we liberate those devices. Nowadays, we have to liberate even CPUs. You know, Intel CPUs have the management engine. It's sort of a, a hostile computer within the computer, one that you don't get to run any programs on. They're already there, uh, and they serve someone else, whoever it might be. And uh, reverse engineering has been done very intensely to deactivate, uh, to to switch out of the line this management engine as it's called and the best that's been done with the recent intel models is uh arrange for it to shut off once the machine is up and running well that's a lot better than uh letting it keep running whether it's good enough well you have to decide that for yourself So free software is extremely important in education. Schools should teach exclusively free software and use exclusively free software in their teaching for moral reasons. <clears throat> and it's not just that schools should use free software, but they should, they should not present this as just a policy we're obeying because they told us to. No, the school should teach the civic reasons for free software, which I have presented. And then it should say, because we value these freedoms, because we want to teach people to value freedom in this classroom, we use only free software and we teach only free software because Teaching the use of a non-free program is teaching dependence. It's like teaching the students to smoke. It's wrong to do that, and the school must never do that. But beyond that, there is also moral education, education in citizenship, such as the virtue of sharing knowledge of sharing with others. So the school should have a rule. If you, you know, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share it with the rest of the students. <clears throat> uh, and that means in particular that the rule would require that you not bring a non-free program to class. Students should be told if you're if you are not prepared to share copies of the program, it's not allowed here. Of course, there's also 
the virtue of free software for education you see every program embodies knowledge don't say the program is knowledge that basically collapses a complicated philosophical relationship but rather the code of the program embodies knowledge well if the program is free it offers that knowledge to the students they're welcome to learn it and make use of that knowledge in their own programming or other activities with software but a non-free program denies that knowledge to the students it is the enemy of the spirit of education and therefore schools should not tolerate it schools should not willingly admit and bow down to the enemy of education they should reject it they should denounce it and they should show that they are serious about this by not allowing it on, into classrooms or labs, not allowing it on campus. Now, this is crucial for the education of the best programmers. You see, how do you learn to be a good programmer? You do it by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. So, <clears throat> By reading lots of code, you learn to understand how things are done. Well, it turns out that only free software lets you read the code of large programs we really use instead of just tiny examples. You can only learn the beginning from, from the small examples. Okay, you need to learn the beginning, but then you've got to go on. You've got to learn how to understand real programs. And only free software gives you the chance to do that. Then you've got to learn to write code for large programs. <clears throat> so you've got to take some large program and work on changing it. And then another large program and then another. And this way you get to be really capable. Well, only free software gives you the chance to do this because free software includes large programs that you can study and then change. So schools should be encouraging this. Schools should actually have, uh, you know, one or two year projects where you make a substantial change in a non-free program and then and coordinating with the developers from the beginning so that you can do it so that they will, you can develop something they will want to install, do it the way that they will be happy with, then, They'll get it installed and tell them, send me the bug reports, please, so that you can debug those bugs, so you can learn how and learn how properly to respond to the people who reported the bugs, get more information from them, ask them to test the fix, and so on. And by the time you're done with that, you will be a skilled software developer. So, <clears throat> I hope you will I hope you will pressure the university to stop having non-free software in its classrooms and labs. Stop asking you to run non-free software. The school has to teach the good citizenship of cooperating with other people. And that applies to all ages of students. So Human rights depend on each other, which means that if you lose one human right, it becomes harder to defend the others. <clears throat> now that we use software for so many important social activities, having control over our software, in other words, that the software be free, has become one of the crucial human rights without which it is hard to defend the other human rights. And that requires making sacrifices. There are websites I simply won't talk to because they require non-free software. And if I really need to do the thing, well, I try to find some way to do it without a computer. <clears throat> I just found out a week ago or so that the website of the state of Massachusetts 
doesn't give you any way to contact the governor's office except running non-free JavaScript code. There's a way to, on the website to send complaints about the website, but it doesn't work if uh, you will run the non-free software, so I can't complain. I also couldn't send my uh, the message I wanted to send as a constituent, but uh, someone was kind enough to write a shell script. No, sorry, I guess it was a, maybe it's a Python program. To me, it's the same. I don't understand either of those languages except at a basic level, uh, which basically uses the implicit API and uh, sends a message. So we can replace these non-free programs and thus advance. Now, I promised to tell you more about online disservices. Basically, there is no limit to the bad things any server, supposedly a service, can do to you. Uh, it can, if it's connected to some product in your home, it can tell that product to do nasty things or it can refuse to let that product do anything. Any data that it gets, it can make available to others and it may be illegal to sell that data but they don't do that anyway instead they uh they rent out the use of it and this way they can say we never give we never sell your data we never give your personal data to anyone facebook says that and in a narrow literal sense it's true but what facebook does is allow the use of that data it has about you for profiling and then Profiling generates other data, data that didn't directly come from the uh, from the uh, poor Zucker that's running Facebook. And well, when Facebook says it doesn't hand over or sell personal data, does that include the profile data? I doubt it. <clears throat> and. Uh, they're all, you know, if Facebook, sorry, if, if a server is supposed to answer your questions, well, you know, it may not make an honest effort to give you the best answer. It could give the answer that somebody else paid it to give. Maybe this is recommending a business and making sure you hear about it often so that you would choose it. Well, that's advertising. Uh, but it can be done either visibly, overtly, or in a hidden way. Something like product placement in movies. I'm sure you've heard of that. It's the same idea. It can, you ask it, which, what's a restaurant near me? And it'll tell you the restaurant it's trying to promote, not, not a list of others. Uh, it can be listening to what you say all the time and then basically whenever it wants to, it hears you. And uh, who knows what they will do with the data of speech recognition on your voice. And uh, it could tell you to uh, go to a certain pizzeria where uh, children are being held prisoner, and there's just no telling. Uh, by the way, that developed into the QA nonsense that uh, lots of Republicans now endorse. <clears throat> so, the only way we can limit, we can determine a limit for what a server could be doing is if we know a limit to what data it actually gets. If the server can't tell who you are, that helps a lot. But if you use it repeatedly and it can tell that it's the same person each time, it can make a dossier even, if, even be, without knowing whose dossier it is and eventually putting that together with other information, it can figure out who. So it's vital that 
the anonymization be such that it can't tell who is it can't tell that the person who made this request just now is the same one who made another one yesterday and uh, what helps with that is to prevent browser fingerprinting that's another malicious thing that JavaScript code sent to the browser can do uh, so web services that send malicious JavaScript code they are also in this way disservices and it's very common uh, I think that the latest version of Google Analytics operates to a large extent by profiling each user well if you use a browser that's designed not to run the javascript programs that can profile and that in other respects tries to pretend to be something else well the most they could find out is oh this is another guy stopping us from profiling who knows which one and he's coming from a Tor node. So that's the best way I know to stop the sites from figuring out who you are or where you are. Uh, location tracking is another nasty thing that disservices do. You know, I figure if, if there's some kind thing the site could do for me and I want it to do that, I'll tell it where I am or a fictitious where I am that'll get me the results I want. And this way, it won't really know because it's none of their business to know. Tracking people is a threat to all human rights because when people are tracked, the state will find out where a person has been. We keep getting scandals that supposedly free countries have been tracking people you know i can't remember if there has been one for canada but you should take a look and see <clears throat> but if there hasn't been one yet surely there will be someday so there are so many bad things a, a service so-called service can do that to prevent them, you've got to basically use a long spoon when you sup with them. You've got to keep them to a distance, communicating with you through a very restricted channel. And then you can tell that they're not going to do anything that would require getting more data than they could get through that restricted channel. And use them uh, only when you need to reject service as a software substitute which is basically an invitation to let a uh, service do your computing for you do your computing in your own computer uh, letting somebody else's server do it for you can be convenient in the short term sense but that's not good for your freedom <clears throat> so how can you help you know if you think free software is an important cause you can do various kinds of work but it's not even just a matter of things you would call work so how can you help well if you're a programmer you can write free software one good programmer over years of working can make enormous contributions to our community but if you can only work a few hours a week in your spare time well in a year you'll produce a package that is respectable as a contribution and will help will perhaps it could liberate people from some non-free programs power but uh, oh i see i should suggest that you contribute to uh, 15 projects d developed by others before you start launching your own project because that way by the time you start your own you'll know how to do it right by having participated in doing it with various other groups you could but if you're not a programmer there are 
things that are just as important that you can do. For instance, you can organize the campaign for using and developing free software, spread the word about how non-free software is an injustice to each user. Oh, and I should mention that uh, this involves two kinds of things. First of all, it's useful to organize a group that campaigns for free software. And second, it can be useful to, it, it's useful to be a speaker, to tell people the issues. So there should be the people who present the issue and the people who organize cooperation and ask people to join the group, record who's a member, collect the annual dues, organize meetings, and so on. Different kinds of skills. Uh, which one are you good at? Which one would you like to learn? By the way, you can develop your speaking skills at a Toastmasters club. I enjoyed that quite a bit when I did it. You can help persuade schools and governments to move to free software. Uh, because each for a different reason should use exclusively free software. You can help other users, you know, even one by one. A user has a problem using some free operating system or free program, and you know how. Well, that encourages people to use free software, so it's a good thing to do. And while you're at it, you can explain to people this, well, some people call this open source, but I call it free Libra software because it's the software that supports users' freedom. And I value freedom, so I work for freedom by helping you use free software and have freedom. And you can go into more details and give people references to more info. And just by saying free software or uh, logiciel libre, you spread the idea of free software. You lead people, perhaps, to find out more about that and why you're not saying open source. So for more information about how you can help, look at gnu.org slash help, because there are dozens of different kinds of work we could use. If you're willing to give us a few hours a week, or in some ways even less, we'll do, uh, please look and see what we need. Maybe you'll find something you'd like to contribute to. For more information on the philosophy of free software, look at uh, gnu.org slash philosophy. For information about free software licenses, which licenses are free, which are not, what's good or bad about various licenses, uh, what each one does, look there. Also, how to use them properly. For why governments should uh, make sure all of their computing is done with free software, basically to make sure that the people control the government's computing and not some company uh, governments should never allow a, any business to control what they're doing. Uh, that unfortunately leads to a situation where companies have dangerous power and we should never allow companies to have dangerous power. When they're getting close to that, it's time to cut them down. Of course, in our society, they've gone far, far beyond that point. We've got to cut them down, way down, as soon as possible, so that they can no longer rule us. But that's a different issue beyond software. In gnu.org slash education, there's everything about schools and uh, how they can move to free software, including using Big Blue Button, a free program, rather than non-free programs to give classes. And in gnu.org slash gnu, you can find the history of the gnu operating system and the free software movement. In gnu.org slash malware, you can find hundreds of examples of malicious functionalities in non-free programs, each with a reference about it, uh, a reference to the press. You know, we're not guessing here. 
We're not exaggerating. We're describing the facts we know. And in uh, and and they're they're classified by the kind of malicious functionality and the kind of uh, either big company or the kind of product that it's in. In GNU.org slash distros, you could find all the information about uh, which GNU slash Linux distros are free and which are not. And now it's time for questions. I'm not going to present St. Ignatius. I only do that in in-person talks. You are now unmuted. Thank you very much, Richard, for your presentation. Um, we do have a number of questions um, that I will just paste into chat so you could read and answer. You are now muted. Uh, can I explain about copyleft? Well, copyleft is a way of using copyright law. If you write a program, normally you have the copyright on that written work. Unless you made a deal that you're writing it for some company and that company gets the copyright. Well, whichever entity it is that has the copyright, can release that program as free software. Well, how do you do that? Today's copyright law was perverted by businesses uh, over a period of many years, and this, uh, this was codified in the Berne Convention, which basically said that everything written was automatically copyrighted. There was no way to avoid it. So you, the author, are being handed this power over other people, whether you wanted it or not. Uh, those who wrote this treaty couldn't imagine you might have other intentions. Although, to be fair, they, were, they wrote that treaty long before computers. And back then, the only way to make any number of copies was with a printing press. And uh, they figured that the only people who were actually restricted by the copyright were others that would want to print it on a printing press, and you could negotiate with them any way you liked. And it wasn't going to oppress the readers at all, because in general, readers don't own, didn't own printing presses or anything equivalent. So the problem, the moral problem of copyright has arisen because we now do have copying engines the best, the greatest copying engines ever developed. And it's tremendously useful and tremendously good for society to copy and share and to modify things too in, in when they're functional, useful things like programs. So given that situation, what do you do if you want the users to be allowed to copy and change something? Well, you have to officially legally give them permission and uh, the way you do that is by posting a state statement giving permission on the work and this is called a, a free software license and it just in, in the simplest form it says well I the author say that you are permitted to make copies of this to distribute copies of this to make modified versions of this and to distribute modified versions of this and uh and you're not restricted about you know whether you charge or not and all a whole a few other things you've got to say and then it's free but i wanted to do more than just make the software free because I had seen how it was easy for someone unscrupulous, someone willing to release non-free software, to take an existing free program and make changes in it, presumably useful changes, and release that as a non-free program and keep the source code totally secret. 
And I realized that if some, if I released free programs in the simple way, I would face competitors who would be using all of my code and not letting me use any of their code, which means I'd be fight, I'd be playing on a sl very sloping playing field with a tremendous disadvantage against me. And I didn't want to have to do that. I wanted to say to them, I'll share with you, but you've got to share back. And that said, you've copy left. And I worked that out into a set of license conditions. So instead of just saying, oh, go ahead and distribute this, go ahead and distribute modified versions, I put down conditions to, make, uh, to insist that when they distribute it, it's got to copy, it's got to carry the same license. And when they distribute a modified version, they've got to distribute the source code along with any compiled versions. And by the way, the definition of compiled, of uh, not compiled versions, it doesn't say compiled, it actually says non-source versions. So a minified version uh, is actually equivalent to a binary. In terms of the GNU general public license, they're treated the same. Basically, either it's the source code, which is the preferred version for uh, understanding and changing the program, or it's a non-source version and it's got to come with the source code. And it has to be the complete corresponding source code. I had to work to make sure there weren't loopholes to uh, comply in some legalistic sense while not respecting the freedom that users should have. And that work is now embodied in version three of the GNU General Public License. When you release under the GNU General Public License, it's important to say uh, under version three or any later version of the GNU General Public License, because nothing is perfect. And uh, that includes me and my work. My programs have had bugs. And someday we may need to change the GNU GPL because either it had a mistake in it or the way people do things has changed and the license has to deal properly with new ways. So we may have to release a GPL version four. There are licenses, other licenses such as the Mozilla public license, I believe, which says, uh, oh, if you release under this license version N, people can use version N plus whatever if they want to. If there is a version N plus whatever, because there may not be one. And uh, in the case of the GNU GPL, the author of the program gets to choose. But please leave an upgrade path for your license. Of, for the license of your program. So, uh, machine learning. Well, machine learning has a bit of trickiness, and it may be fundamentally unreliable. You know, uh, it appears that uh, you can train machine learning with the same set of test cases, and sometimes you'll get uh, some a trained neural net that does basically the right thing for weird for intermediate and slightly strange cases and sometimes you'll get one that'll flip out totally on those things but it turns out that if you take a trained neural network and that's all you've got you can change what it does by running more training on it so the fact that you didn't get the original set of test cases doesn't matter much. In fact, all you have to do is train it some more on some reasonable test cases. And if there was some weird thing in it that would flip out in some horrible way on a particular kind of case, uh, then uh, 
that would go away with some additional training. It's sort of, it's almost, it's equivalent to the artifacts that might be there accidentally. So I think we can treat the trained neural network as the source code. This doesn't eliminate the disadvantages of machine learning in terms of understanding what something's going to do. Oh, how can we avoid contributing to non-free organizations while maintaining a high quality of life? Uh, you mean maintaining a high income? Well, you know what? Sometimes you may find that in a society which is structurally unjust, the only way to be one of the wealthy few is to participate in injustice. You'll have to draw a line of what kinds of injustice you're willing to tolerate. And then you can look for ways that you can get by with less money. For instance, I decided not to have children. Now, I didn't just do this so I could get by with less money. I, I have lots of reasons for preferring not to have children. Uh, when you look at how unpleasant it is to get divorced and hardly ever see your children, but have to work uh, 60 hours a week on a project you hate, but it pays a lot, you know, I decided I'd have a much happier life without children. Also, love relationships last much better without children. And if you feel like spending some time taking care of some children, there are lots of children already born that could really use some loving care. But you don't have to be the main one responsible. You don't have to do it you know, 30 hours a week, in addition to the 60 hours a week that you're working and, you know, it's, and it's so much easier and it's the main thing you can do to reduce your carbon footprint as well. It's enormous compared with all the other things you could do. So uh, do this and then you will free a large part of your life to work on doing good in whichever way. You know, suppose you don't see how you can get by without doing some paid work for a project you don't think is good. But if you're getting paid at a high rate, maybe you can do that 20 hours a week. If you don't need to live in a luxurious way, if you live in a sensible country, with a national medical system, makes it so much easier. But you ultimately, it comes down to your conscience. Have you trained your conscience to fully feel the wrong of what you'd be doing? Because those feelings are what motivate people to fight for human rights and human freedom. What do I think of Snowden and other whistleblowers? They're heroes. So let me say, three cheers for Edward Snowden. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. When I send out email, normally, you know, unless I delete it, Every message starts with a note uh, to all FBI and NSA employees reading my email. Please consider whether defending the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign or domestic, calls for you to follow Snowden's example. Now, that refers to an oath that some of them sign as the basic idea of their what their duty is. So I am appealing to their patriotism to defend freedom in the United States from the government of the United States when they are told to unjustly limit it. Oh, 
oh, content creators. Well, I find it disgusting to refer to works of authorship, such as books, movies, and programs as content. That word carries the attitude that those works are not really important individually. They're just meant to fill up a box. And it doesn't matter what the box is filled with as long as it's full. This is the attitude, I suppose, of the executives of Amazon or Netflix or so many other companies uh, towards whatever they're distributing and getting some money from. And then they call the authors creators, which in a way compares them to gods. It treats them as divine and thus more important than us. Well, I have also written things that have been published and some people appreciate, but I won't call myself a creator. Uh, as far as we know, the universe just happens to be here and was never created at all. And yes, I did make uh, the programs I've released, but that doesn't mean I have to use a word that makes this uh, implicit comparison. And then protect. Actually, it doesn't make sense to protect a copyright. What is it in danger from? A court case? You know, that's the only thing that could eliminate the copyright. Uh, no, these are the propaganda terms that they use to mean crushing people who share, stopping them from sharing. I say that shouldn't be done. That's wrong. That is oppression. And that's why I won't use those disservices. I won't, I will not get a copy in a way that stops me from copying it and sharing it. And I also will not make an agreement saying I won't copy it and share it. I choose not to get it that way. Rather than engage in this betrayal of my fellow humans, in particular, my friends. Now, I don't mind disregarding copyright law and sharing anyway. But I can't necessarily disregard DRM if we don't have a way to break it. So if I won't, if I won't be able to share, I don't take that copy. If you offered me a Blu-ray disc, I'd say, what good is that? I, I can't share it, so and I can't read it with free software, so take it away. I don't want it. Uh, if you offered me an Amazon ebook, uh, which you know uh, has DRM on it, well, I know you can break that DRM. If I could break that DRM, I might uh, be happy to do so. But if you asked me to sign something saying I wouldn't distribute a copy, I'd have to say I can't sign that. Now, maybe I can get a printed copy of the book. Printed copies don't oppress. And printed copies, well, I can get one in a bookstore and then I won't have to say who I am. So it won't track me either. I can't order one online. I, I basically don't ever order anything online myself, but there are some people I know who feel no qualms about doing that for themselves and they'll do it for me also and they'll resell the book to me. Now, I wish they would get wise and refuse to order online, but can't convince everybody of everything. So basically, I don't think that authors deserve to oppress the whole world to get money. I've proposed other ways to support authors better because that is a good, a desirable goal. But if we get rid of the idea that the goal is to, quote, protect, unquote, and instead say the goal is to support authors and artists better, we can 
easily see better ways to do it. Now, I've proposed some. If you look at gnu.org slash philosophy slash copyright versus community dot html, you can see a couple of the ways I propose. You are uh, now unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. It didn't occur to me that I should. You should have said so before. You are now muted. Well, I can people see these questions? Has it been good enough? You are now. I unmuted. suppose it's been clear enough. Thinking back, but uh, okay, sure. Do you feel, in the light of the you are now muted. service as a software substitute? By the way, the abbreviation for that is SAS. And we say, don't sass me. Uh, the, the sass phenomenon that AGPL ought to be rec the recommended license for projects aiming to promote free software ideals. Well, um, it's not crucial for many programs, but if the program is specifically likely to be of interest to servers and uh, extended for servers are modified and used, and the modified versions used on servers, then yes, you should use the AGPL. Uh, um. Are there any more questions or am I done? You are now unmuted. Oh, here. You are now muted. No, you can, you can uh, get ahead of me, you know. You can start typing the next one now. Uh, let's do unmuted. overlapped processing. One recurring feature of large-scale free muted. software projects is fragmentation. By the nature of free software, there is a desire to contribute from the general public, which often leads to different developers having different goals with the project. Though so this creates a diversity in options, it le leads to a less consistent system for end users to actually enjoy. Uh, from your experience with the GNU project, does there exist a framework in which free contributions to free projects and fragmentation don't have to go hand in hand? Well, I don't know any way that eliminates this tendency but in general if you've got a group of good capable people working on the program most people will want to get their contributions included however an obstacle can arise when some people are too uh, have are too much interested in just going it alone and the immediate benefits and they don't want to participate in a system of cooperation to make sure you don't make a mistake or go wrong. And you know that's been happening to GNU Emacs actually since the 1990s, it's a shame. Around 1989, a company, a small company's boss decided he wanted to add certain features to Emacs. He hired a team to write them. His idea was that those people would cooperate with me, but he didn't make sure they did so. So they just designed things themselves without consulting me. They implemented it and it was done. They said to me, we'd like you to incorporate all our changes. Why don't you just take them and put them in? Well, that's not very cooperative as an attitude. So I looked over the code and they said, oh, if you want to make modifications, you're on your own. We won't help you do that. Thank you so much. Well, I did that myself. Some of the things they had done, uh, I incorporated with changes. Some I threw away their code and incorporated it. And I wrote something else to do the same job. And eventually, Emacs has the same changes but the same features. So, you know, what can we do? We have to educate people in how to cooperate with upstream. 
and there used to be something I think called upstream university for a while that taught some groups of people how to cooperate with upstream. I don't think it went on for many years. Maybe everyone that in its target range had been taught, but maybe such things need to continue in some way. How does one sell free software? Uh, well, it's not as easy to do in the simple way as now. You know, through the mid 90s, the Free Software Foundation raised a lot of funds by selling copies at a rather high price. And back then, there were many different computer architectures and many different system platforms. So our experts would build something for your choice of platform and send you the binaries as well as the source. And we charge something like $5,000 for that. And of course, people partly paid it as a way to support us, but partly because it was a useful service. But nowadays, that doesn't work very well. However, uh, it sometimes does work to some extent. And donations are much easier to use now. The sad thing is, by the way, most crowdfunding platforms require people to run non-free software to donate at all, but there are exceptions that have provided a way to do it. I think it was uh, damn is it code and supply? I'm not remembering the name clearly. It's so many years since I thought about it. And then there is Goteo, I think, still allows that. You are now if non-free software did not exist, it seems to me that much invaluable research that happens in industry would not be happening. Uh, you are now fine. Muted. If we really wanted that research, we would get the government to fund it. So this is an example where it can look in the short term as if some non-free software is vitally important. But in the long term, having software to do whatever it is is important, but it doesn't have to be non-free. Today, you can have the choice of run non-free program foo or nothing. But in the long term, it's have a non-free program foo to do this or have a free program to do this. Which way do you direct society's efforts? Uh, we obviously like to help every user find a path to using free software for all her needs. Uh, I, the person who asked this typed all their needs, but we're talking about one person. And I use, someone is phoning me. This will not, I'll have to say a call later. Hello, uh, I'm giving a talk. Uh, can you call later? Oh, I haven't got one of those for, for a long time. It was a robot message from the city, probably urge, reminding me to wear a mask or something like that. Well, I always wear a mask when I'm with other people or outside. <clears throat> so, uh, for all per needs, I use the singular pronouns, person, per, and pers. Their gender neutral pronouns can be used for anyone without disrespecting anybody's gender identity. Uh, sometimes people can't, won't, or just aren't ready. You've spoken about the need to take it one decision at a time. Do you have advice for keeping these folks enthusiastic on their journey to a fully free computing environment? Well, uh, making sure these people are informed about the tendency for non-free programs to be malware may help i don't have a i don't have a recipe that works in general for convincing people because people are too different from each other 
uh, that's something you'll just have to try, and maybe people can can, can meet together and uh, think about what works better. What can Canadians do better to 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 better the world of tech if most of the innovation is happening in the U.S. First of all, don't focus so much on innovation. The focus on innovation is a distraction from the things that are really important. You see, innovation can be good or bad. Democracy was once an innovation. Tyranny was once an innovation. What is it that, in, how can we expect innovation to be good for people? Well, if people decide which ad innovations we adopt, at least it gives us a chance to reject the innovations that we immediately don't like. There can still be problems that arise a way down the road that we can't foretell. We, can't, we don't know a way to judge perfectly about the future. But if people do not get to choose the innovations, then suppose companies choose which innovations to uh, feed to us whether we like it or not. Suppose Apple does that. Suppose Google does that. They do that. They have the power to put innovations, even malicious ones, into their programs, they have the power to decide, oh, we're not going to support, uh, what's it called? It's the protocol for downloading your email from a server and or the protocol for downloading messages and saying, telling the server which messages to delete. That, things that allow you to use your own email client. And, uh, and Google is making it hard to support a free email client anymore. Uh, what do you do? They can do this because they're so powerful. So, and by the way, that's an innovation, not supporting free email clients anymore with security guidelines that a free program can't clearly satisfy and you can't even apply without running into for to go through their security protocol without running non-free software so uh if you want innovation to generally be good for people insist on free software only and free technology and then maybe you can stop them from shoving nasty innovations down your throat. How can I get my non-tech friends to know about the free software movement? Well, someone recently talked with me about the idea of emphasizing how non-free software is a base is a is a base for making e-waste through programmed obsolescence. We keep computers running for decades because we can, because we can keep our free systems supporting the older hardware. As old as the hardware is that people really want to keep supporting, they'll be, it'll be supported. But with proprietary hardware, the manufacturer has the power to make the old models obsolete. It's no accident that the groups that repurpose old computers and sell them cheap or even give them away usually do this with free software. They usually use GNU slash Linux because GNU slash Linux is maintained by people for the sake of using it rather than by a company for the sake of profiting from it by extracting money out of the users. Now, this is something that people will, will care about, both because they don't like being abused and cheated, and because they're concerned with global heating disaster, especially young people who are likely to be killed by it. Uh, you've heard about 
climate refugees. How would you like to have 200 million climate refugees because the other 150 million died already in the US? You are now unmuted. You are now muted. You are now unmuted. You are now muted. Uh, the web standards are basically being controlled by Google, et cetera, at this point, and the Chromium slash Firefox browsers though being free, regularly do bad things to the users. Is the web basically a lost cause at this point? Well, I, would ex I wouldn't go so far, basically, because using the web is so important, we can't give up. We've got to fight for it. Uh, but yes, uh, when we saw the World Wide Web Consortium endorse DRM, basically it was the usual way that people who don't have strong values of freedom are induced to sell out. They were told, you'll have some influence on this. If you endorse the scheme, you can have some influence on the details of it. And the EFF proposed one way they could use that influence to make things a little less nasty. And the W3C rejected it, apparently finding that their new corporate masters were not willing to let the details be influenced far enough to make much of a difference. So they sold out for uh, influence on really minor things. And basically, you need to have the courage to say, no, I won't sell out. I, if it's going to be done anyway, at least it won't be done by me. And this way, we can continue denouncing what you're doing. Of course, you can't be funded by those companies if you want to do this. Uh, that was the initial mistake of the World Wide Web Consortium to try to take a lot of money from companies and do more. And as long as the things it was doing were mostly just practical and didn't confront important moral issues of who has power over people, I guess it worked out okay. But ultimately it does. But we still can't give up. We need to together push back on the non-free JavaScript. Uh, we need to write replacement JavaScript. We need to complain to organizations saying, uh, please give us a way to use your website without JavaScript. And maybe we will win enough that it will do some good. But there's just no use not trying. You can't win anything by surrendering. That just chooses immediate defeat. The World Wide Web Consortium may think it won something, but not really. So 
but we can't let it be a lost course. We have to keep fighting. Now, here's one example. One organization I think is very important is Fridays for Future. I've participated in some climate strike events, and I want to inform people about them. But now they're running their website such that you can't find out what time and place to go except by running non-free software. What a shame. And I don't think it's that anyone in that organization wants people to be subjugated in their browsing. Surely it's that they have never thought about the question. What a shame. Could we get their, their attention? Could we convince anyone to pay attention? I don't know a way to do that. But someone wrote a, a program to scrape the site and put the same information into a simple HTML page such that, you know, first you find your country and then it's uh, alphabetical by the city and you can find the event you want to join. And so uh, we solved that problem. Now the thing is just to convince them, would you please, uh, would you please make a link to that? so that people who don't run JavaScript get to see that instead, or make that an unconditional link, or run that software on your own machine and maintain it, you know, then you'll be the one making that simple, flat page. Uh, it won't look as cutesy, but it works perfectly well if you want to find out where the protest is. So maybe we just need enough people saying to them on the site, it really bothers me that to support your important cause, I have to urge people to go against my other important cause. There's no reason for this conflict to happen. It was just failure to do a little bit of work, please. Do you know anyone more dedicated to free software than yourself? I don't think so. Of course, I wouldn't necessarily know. I know some people who are very dedicated, but I don't, I wouldn't know how they compare with me. I don't know, you know, there are various ways to be dedicated. I'm very dedicated in the form, in the line of personally rejecting unjust programs. But another way is working on free software. And some people do a lot of work on free software, whereas a lot, some of my activism is for other causes. Uh, how do you feel about Microsoft buying, oh, there's, oh, I see it has to scroll. What the hell? Oh. Oh, damn, why did it go all the way up to the top? This mouse is not reliable. How do you feel about Microsoft's buying GitHub? Well, GitHub did so much harm, leading people astray in terms of choice, choosing licenses and how to use licenses that you've chosen and what the options really are and what they do that my initial reaction was, gee, Microsoft could make it worse or make it better, who knows? Let's hope Microsoft makes it better. I don't think Microsoft has particularly made it better. Uh, has free software gone where you wanted it to go? Will it go further in the future even if you aren't there? Well, it's gone partly in the way I wanted it to go. It hasn't gone all the way. Of course, lots of, developments have occurred that I didn't anticipate. And what will happen in the future? I don't know, but it depends on you. How much are you going to campaign for free software? What is your position plan on the future of body chip interfaces? How can we ensure free software and free hardware to enable a brighter future for such devices? Or is their very existence antithetical to freedom? Well, 
that depends a lot on the nature of society overall. In a plutocratist society, which is what we now have, at least in the U.S., and for the most part in other countries, even those with a democratic form, uh, you'll see employers requiring people to get those chips put in, running non-free software, controlled by the employer. And you'll see people saying, yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? But I have no choice. How do we get them a choice? We have to defeat plutocracy. You know, we have to defeat, well, in the U.S., we have a choice between an extreme right-wing anti-truth party and the plutocratist Democratic Party, which is basically center-right. And then there are the progressives, who I generally support. Uh, and the, there are progressives in the Democratic Party, and there is the Green Party. In Canada, I don't know if there's a party which is sufficiently environmentalist. Uh, what can you say? But in, there's also, I don't know if there's one which is sufficiently intent on reducing the power of companies. We've got to break up the companies. We can't allow companies to be so big. I proposed once a kind of uh, progressive taxation on business gross income. The idea is you calculate the total by adding up all the various affiliated companies all around the world. And that determines the tax rate. And then you, you being a, company, a country, you tax the part of the, the gross income that happened in your country at that rate. And why do you do it progressively? Because this pressures companies to split up so that they can pay less taxes. Well, this is a way of get, getting rid of big companies. Most big companies will split up, will get more competition, and will get it without having to sue companies one by one and pay $100 million to fight the lawsuit against each one. It'll just be the tax rules. Uh, you will obviously be remembered as a pioneering thinker, especially in the area of user rights and corporate responsibilities. Actually, I disagree. It's not a matter of corporate responsibilities. It's a matter of taking away their power and dominion. If corporations or more generally businesses are so big and powerful, we have to talk about their responsibilities. That means they have too much power. This is what the government is for to stop them from mistreating us. Of course, we should teach them that it's criminal to mistreat people instead of saying it's your responsibility to be a good corporation and not mistreat people. We should be saying if you mistreat people that way, we'll catch you. Uh, if there is one thing you could realistically, the, continuing with the question, if there's one thing you could realistically add to your legacy, what would it be? Victory. Or more victory. As young developers, what are our realistic options for making money while writing free software in 2020 and beyond? Well, if you live in a cheap way, you'll be able to write free software in your copious spare time while making a nice living and saving some money in much less of your time. Meanwhile, there's an area where you can uh, definitely write free software and get paid for it. Your job could be free software. And that is if what you do is web development because uh, basically, a website software is custom software. It's developed for one client to use. And you can deliver it to the client as free software. In fact, if the client is not basically a babe in arms, it will say to you, uh, 
we've got to get the source code under a free license for everything you develop. We can't just leave you having power on it. What if we want to hire somebody else someday? So if you make it non-free, you're basically taking advantage of clients as suckers. It's a a nasty business practice, which I hope you have enough conscience not to do. But uh, the client will still have to pay you to write it. The fact that you're delivering it in, in a way that respects the client is not going to have any effect on that. I better call a halt. It's been two hours. I hope you will join the Free Software Foundation. And it's also good to tell people that you're joining the, so the Free Software Foundation because I encouraged it. You could even put that in your mail signature and your social media. You are now unmuted. Uh, thank you very much, RMS, for doing the talk and for taking questions and answers. Um, of course, there were a lot of questions. Um, if RMS missed any of them, feel free to um, email. try emailing them to him. Um, he gets a lot of emails. Well, so he... you can. You can, but really, <laughs> uh, I'm terribly overloaded. Please first take a look for answers. Right. A lot of these questions have answers in GNU.org. Yeah. Please look first. Please understand that my ability to achieve things is weighted down. Right. Um, yeah, so definitely um, first check the GNU.org pages. There's um, definitely some on fsf.org as well. And then if you didn't find an answer to your question, then uh, maybe consider emailing RMS. Um, well, I don't have to be the first one you ask, you know. There are lists yeah. for asking these questions so other people can answer them. That is also true. OK, so uh, let's call a night. And uh, thank you again, RMS. Happy hacking. And bye. You are now muted. You are currently the only person in this conference.